my warm greetings to one and all here i uh, satya pulkuri the associate editor of the conference of the forum i welcome you all to the first session on warfare strategies and battlefield lessons from russia ukraine war organized by indic researchers forum indic researchers forum is an independent think tank that aims at bringing out quality research on geopolitics national security uh, through a civilizational perspective on this note let me welcome our uh, session air vice marshal pk shrivastav is the former chief of signals information warfare and information technology of the indian army sir has served as a former director of the bharat dynamics limited bdl the only missile manufacturing defense public sector undertaking of the country he also served as the former vice president of lnt defense he is a writer on defense technology and production issues and a regular uh, and regular on national tv on defense matters now allow me to welcome our distinguished speakers our first speaker Air Marshal Anil Kosla, retired former Vice Chief of Air Staff, Indian Air Force; Lieutenant General Shokin Chawan, retired former Director General Assam Rifles; former Chairman Ceasefire Monitoring Group; and our next speaker, Lieutenant General P K Shankar, retired former Director General Artillery; and Sir is also the Professor at IIT Madras. And uh, our uh, next speaker, Lieutenant General R S Panwar, Distinguished Fellow, United Service Institution of India; and our last speaker, Major General Shashi Astana, Doctor Major General Shashi Astana, Sir. retired director courses united service institution of india now i'll hand over the floor to the session chair over to you sir uh thank you very much uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen welcome to the session uh, which is titled as warfare strategies and battlefield lessons from russia ukraine war first of all i must thank yashesh and particularly ethnic researcher forum for inviting me to chair this very contemporary and intriguing topic why i call it intriguing because this war has had its global impact on supply chains causing major disruptions in food grains edible oil energy and other day to day items setting inflation and shortages to all time high in most parts of the world including developed countries like us britain and europe yet this war has continued for more than one year with explicit and declared support of western powers especially us none is attempting to bring this to an end as if a victory of either side is a necessary condition ukraine is being provided with military equipment and ammunition to sustain the continuation of conflict no major diplomatic initiative has been undertaken by ukraine or supporting major powers rather ukraine is being inspired to fight on for the sake of democracy and its right to sovereign choice to join nato if it so desires ukraine has been the battleground its people land and infrastructure are all devastated its economy has contracted by nearly 40% it has support of almost 50 countries and has been provided with aid of nearly 100 billion dollars in terms of military equipment and humanitarian relief of course it has been given no boots on ground so far it has been provided with defensive arms and ammunition that do not encourage to strike deep into russian heartland is the warfare strategy to bleed russia to such an extent that russia will shine as a military superpower was this war necessitated by nato's eastward expansion as stated by russia leading to existential crisis for russia or was it part of the western strategy to push russia into this conflict to achieve its own geopolitical objectives and ukraine is just another country which got embroiled into it should present president zelensky been more statesman like and avoided direct conflict or invitation to conflict taking lessons from decades old cuban crisis in nutshell what's going on in russia ukraine war in terms of warfare strategies and what are the battlefield lessons we have an august panel of speakers to decode each aspect of this war to you to have such an elite panel in one session is really remarkable and organizers organizers must be complimented for the same please allow me to start the session by inviting air marshal uh, anil khosla who will be speaking on evolving nature of aerial warfare for the speakers we have 15 minutes and uh, please allow me to give a reminder uh, two minutes before the time wraps up so that you can wrap up in time 
As regards to Air Marshal Anil Khosla, he is former Vice Chief of Air Staff of the Indian Air Force. While in service, he handled Doklam operations with China and Balakot strike against Pakistan. An alumnus of National Defense Academy, he has over 4,000 hours of accident free flying, which is very important. Accident free flying mainly on different variants of Jaguar, MiG 21, and Kiran aircraft. He was also involved with the formulation of Air Force war plans, post structure planning, and capability building. He holds two MPhil degrees on defense and strategic studies, pursuing PhD on China. How does dragons brain work? A very interesting topic, sir, indeed. May I invite you to kindly start your talk? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, uh, for the kind words. And uh, can, you, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. And thank you very much for the uh, to Indic uh, Research Forum for giving me this opportunity to share my views on the subject. And a very, very relevant uh, theme for the seminar. One year has gone past in this conflict between Russia and Ukraine. And we need to look into the geopolitical aspects as well as uh, battlefield uh, uh, activities and lessons. And uh, I've been asked to cover the air aspects related to the uh, conflict. The time is very short, 15 minutes. So I will dive into the subject straight away and I will speak fast, maybe at supersonic speed, not hypersonic, the new <laughs> weapons which are coming into the air warfare. Okay, so the event, uh, the conflict, uh, one year old, uh, one year plus now, has thrown up a lot of aspects related to new world order, multilateralism, collective security, nuclear deterrence, economic sanctions, economic warfare, info warfare, food and energy security. I mean, the list is endless and we need to look into these aspects. The questions which are being asked and there are no easy answers is, why has Russia not used its full might? You know, if you take air uh, comparison itself, uh, Russia is ranked second and uh, Ukraine is ranked 27th. The disparity is about eight to ten times and why is he not used the full uh, force and second question is why is ukraine president ukrainian president uh, continuing when his country is getting battered so badly uh, third question is how long will this situation last i think these questions we need to look into and uh, find some answers so what i'll do is i'll cover a few things related to the perspective of the war which will automatically which are relevant to the drawing of lessons and I will tag the lessons because with, uh, I mean, most of the things have already been touched upon. Plus, a learned uh, audience uh, already knows these lessons. Each lesson itself is a topic in itself. And I will be touching a few of the air warfare lessons. <laughs> so, first of all, uh, you know, the conflict would have, my that's my reading is that conflict would have ended in the beginning itself in the first few weeks, if not month. Uh, Two things which are relevant. One is, you know, in the beginning when the war started, Zelensky was in a conciliatory mood and uh, he was willing to negotiate and, 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 and somehow he changed his mind thereafter and this uh, history thereafter. Why he changed his mind? Maybe under pressure from uh, West or influence from the West that we need to look into. But the war got prolonged. The second is a tactical uh, reason. You know, the Russia went for the juggler in the beginning itself. Uh, to go into Kiev and maybe have a regime change and he would have succeeded you know he did a three-pronged uh, approach that is two on the ground and one from the air Uh, can you hear me? Now you're audible. Sorry, sorry, my fault. Uh, I think I lost the connection for in between. Yeah, so I was talking about uh, uh, the air bridge part didn't work out because of a simple small weapon, which I'll talk about it later. Okay, so uh, it's already been touched upon in the broader sense. It is not a Russia versus Ukraine war. It is between the East and the West bloc. And uh, info warfare is heavily dominated by the West. These issues are important because we should not draw long lessons out of it. Okay, I divide the war into three phases. 
first i called the juggler phase so in the juggler phase as i was telling you if the air bridge had formed you know they had taken over a airfield which is 10 kilometers from kiev that is called antonov airfield or hostomel uh, airfield is a cargo airfield and the idea was to pump in a whole lot of helicopters and transport aircraft they did a special operation took over the airfield but these helicopters and transport aircraft could not land there because of shoulder fired missiles and the the cost would have been very very high prohibitively high so you can imagine because of one weapon we have a similar case you know we have helicopters operating in naxal areas and we at times uh, they get uh, you know bullet uh, hits and all that so it's a very important lesson is that you know one is taking over airfield is one but we need to cater for sanitization of the airspace around and second is the vulnerability of these platforms in a contested airspace had the air bridging worked out maybe the war would have finished earlier the idea was to pump in combatants idea was to pump in you know supplies weapons and everything okay uh, the next is you know the, the supply lines got extended and the plan failed so the second phase was uh, russia had to rethink realign itself and he started concentrating on the uh, uh, dpr lpr area as well as the crimea side south southern area <clears throat> i call it uh, urban guerrilla warfare phase so what happened was uh, it was like a urban warfare guerrilla warfare where russia was attacking cities ukraine was defensive in nature following the shoot and scoot method of uh, you know warfare both for ground as well as air uh, platforms you know shoulder fired missiles and weapons and firing and uh, hiding so that sort of a touch uh, up and down went on for quite some time for 5 6 months and uh, you know cities fell one after the other to russian uh, this thing and this phase continued for quite some time so what is intriguing was why did russia did not pursue his air superiority he had so much of uh, disparity of uh, air for uh, support with him why didn't he use his latest weapons and all those things he got trolled of course in the media but that is all western propaganda as well as anyway end of this uh, phase what they achieved russia achieved uh, was that created a corridor between ukraine and him in the dpr lpr area it consolidated uh, uh, consolidated the uh, hold on crimea by having better connectivity by power supply water supply then he almost supply uh, almost denied access uh, access to the sea to ukraine but subsequently he had to given few of the uh, wins which he had got he destroyed the ukraine military as well as installations as well as defense selectively defense industry so he achieved all this now the third phase what i call is retaliation and punitive action phase which is continuing as expected russia has done a referendum declared that these are my areas and uh, these are my regions and uh, as far as he is concerned he says now war is over as far as i am concerned but as expected you no know, ukraine would retaliate with the us support and the west support and i i can't call it leco because the intensity of the operations keep going up and down keeps increasing now at the moment it is high because of the war for akut uh, town and uh, recently on 9th they have fired six uh, uh, hypersonic missiles and 80 odd missiles and drones so the fight is on so the tempo keeps increasing so ukraine will retaliate punitive action will come from russia so that is what is happening now how long will it carry on anybody is guessed will the west keep on egging them will the people of ukraine decide enough is enough now or russia will change her heart i don't think any of this is going to happen in a hurry unless you know some escape route is given to all of them and uh, some sort of escape route comes out okay uh, so let's uh, talk about lessons a lot of most of the lessons have already been touched in the first session i will just tag them so one is atmanirbhar self reliance made in india in much broader sense not only in defense uh, industry and defense production but in broader sense the supply chain you know uh, uh, general talked about uh, the chip industry and uh, in a lot of uh, areas okay the war is changing as i said it's not only military is go to war the nation goes to war so all the tools uh, state tool craft under time diplomatic in the, uh, no military uh, every every thing and anything can be used as a weapon like chinese do so the whole nation needs to gear up it has to be a whole of government approach to the conflict okay one lesson which has stood out is nobody is going to come and fight for you so you have to fight your own battles but notwithstanding that still you know multilateralism is alive and uh, relevant collective security we should have a open mind and not only we should keep increasing our in, uh, interoperability with friendly countries the reason is you know the gray zone warfare also was mentioned in the first session 
and chinese have mastered the art of gray zone uh, warfare so even if it is no declared war doesn't mean there is a peace existing there hostile activities can carry on in the newer domains and interoperability or friendly relations with friendly countries would help in terms of you know diplomatic support in terms of information sharing in terms of int sharing and whole lot of other things mitigation of situations then next lesson which is came out in the beginning itself was out of area contingencies we have our diaspora all over the world and we have contingency plans so far we have been doing well so in future also we should continue uh, you know uh, refining and reviewing these plans nuclear deterrence works i will not dwell upon it it's a subject in itself both sides it has worked uh, sorry that was my alarm i said before the chair tells me i will put up my alarm so that i can okay i'll wind up in another 2 minutes uh energy security we need to look into holistically you know in terms of storage in terms of domestic uh, sources in terms of alternative sources supply chain issues economic sanctions don't deter war but they need to be catered for in the plans because they got a long term effect okay we need to increase our deterrence capability and when i say capability it involves capacity as a uh, former defense secretary said that it's a long drawn war no short war so capacity also comes into it technology we need to harness and in india we need to review the thing it should not be it should be parallel processing in civil and military use both you know we should learn from china in terms of civil military fusion under six verticals you know in terms of industry infrastructure skill technology equipment mobility all these things under six verticals they got a very good model going okay the importance in the war of human factors i call them human factors related to training morale experience leadership even tactics and strategy it has come out that's very very important info warfare of course everyone has talked about i will not talk about it and uh, as i said west has dominated due to what i have my theory about russians not jumping into the fray but we'll leave it at that okay uh, last one minute chair just to ta tag a few of air related uh, lessons one is restricted use of air power increases the cost the cost of achieving your objectives cost of time cost of losses cost of money we have example kargil we have fought with one hand tied behind the back so the air power has to be unleashed fully not not restricted the offensive and defensive there is no separate uh, use of air power it is you know enmeshed with each other they cannot be separated survivability of platforms like helicopters drones transports uh, aircraft in a contested air space is a very very important factor which needs to be catered for in the campaign or in the war the efficacy of no fly zone you know ukraine kept asking for no fly zone from the west you know it's not uh, so easy it's not only that you declare something and uh, the enemy will stop coming you should have the wherewithal to uh, implement it in terms of radar in terms of pickup in terms of weapons so that uh, you can uh, if you have influ in, in case you have declared a no fly zone at least you can implement it and the most important thing is the importance of standoff and precision weapons which was covered earlier also okay uh, now a few last in the end what i'll say is that the warfare is changing drastically the drones are coming in a big way the whole world is working towards manned and unmanned platform uh, uh, together that is both uh, uh, taking advantage of both of them the loyal wingman concept is being pursued by the west we have our own indian program cats uh, cats program which were declared in the last aero india and now they have declared few more things about uh, this program so that is what is going to come in the sixth generation fighter aircraft or the platforms which are coming in they will be working in this network environment where manned and unmanned platforms will work together hypersonics uh, as i said six missiles were fired day for yesterday a big change both offensive and defensive capability then last two is technology we need to harness and second is that we need to reorientate ourselves for gray zone operations that is operations which continue even when there is no war like situation and the last is the maximum smile on the faces due to this war is one is china and second is the us arms industry thank you for patient hearing and thank you chair for not ringing the bell <laughs> thank you very much thank you sir that was a very very simplified and decoded version of the whole one year of the war which went on absolutely brilliant and you brought out 
uh, one fact very intriguingly, which was intriguing all of us, why the air power was not unleashed in full. Of course, that remains a mystery till date. But you rightly established that that has caused the continuation of war and so much of losses on both sides and loss of face, I would say, for Russia too. But the lessons of war which you brought out are absolutely brilliant for the young ones who are on the panel. That yes, precision munitions are going to dominate. Unmanned combat vehicles are going to the way of life. And we need to indigenize because indigenization not only in military terms, indigenization as a uh, probably as a national power is more important than only in the military terms and civil and military have to combine together and follow the Chinese model, which is already there. And I think that's one thing you can copy from your adversity too. And as you rightly said, technology is going to rule the roost. We have to learn how to get the technology by our own selves and how to have a DARPA like model where we invest and we are not really shy of investing even if the results don't come through. Thank you very much, sir. It was one of the very brilliant talks given by. So it gives me a chance to invite the next speaker, who is our Lieutenant General, Dr. Shaukin Chauhan. He, is the, he was the chairman of the ceasefire monitoring group in August 2018. He was the Director General of Assam Rifles, India's oldest and largest paramilitary force. He has held several key appointments during his long career in the army. He has served at the apex level in military or defense, Ministry of Defense and Ministry of Home Counter Insurgency, Counter Terrorism, Border Guarding and Human Resource Management. He also has vast experience in military diplomacy since he was the defense attache in the Indian Embassy in Nepal for three and a half years. Over to you, sir, on your topic, conventional forces in irregular warfare and role of military leadership. I think you have to switch on your mic, sir. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Indeed, an honor to be a part of uh, this wonderful panel. I just heard my very close friend and uh, co-smit Anil Khosla speak on uh, the air warfare and the lessons. And I can't uh, couldn't agree anymore with him. He's absolutely right. So. Uh, in the next 15 minutes or 20 minutes max, I would be talking about what is the concept of victory that that the Russians had set out on, what did the Americans or NATO plan to do, and subsequently, uh, you know, what were their what were their objectives, and lastly, of course, uh, the irregular warfare uh, has it has it already entered the irregular warfare stage. Is there a stage for irregular warfare? Is there a future for irregular warfare in this high-tech warfare uh, that is going on between them? And what what exactly do I see crystal ball giving? Okay, so the issues here are, what do you take as the 21st century strategy for a, theor for a theory of victory? When you decide that if you are planning to go in for a war or if you're planning to go in as a proxy, for a war, what would be the victorious issue? What would you call as victory? So, firstly, attaining policy objectives is victory in this in century. In proposing a theory of victory, I assume that there is a grand strategy in place for the NATO support for the Ukraine, and which the joint staff of you of, of NATO is contest, contest, uh, continuously assessing. How much support can we can they give Ukraine? How much can they continue to give? And are they actually believing in the narrative that is being generated the, that the Ukraine armed forces are actually defeating or actually holding the Russians in place? So when they started, what were the five policy objectives? Firstly, the, the, the first one was supporting the Ukraine in its fight to help it recover economically and in, encourage its regional integration with the European Union. That was the first objective. Second was defend NATO territory, which had not yet come into play, and build and deepen the coalition to weaken Russia and then prevent Russia from causing any harm to European security, democracy, and institutions. And the third was to deter and respond to Russian actions that were threatening core U.S. interests, including the Nord Pipeline. Fourth was to prevent Russia 
or any power in this case Russia to achieve its objectives through using or threatening to use nuclear weapons. And the last is to sustain and develop practical modes of interaction to deal with Russia that are mutually beneficial for all the NATO countries. So what did, what exactly did Vladimir Putin decide when he decided to announce uh, Russia's recent withdrawal from, uh, from the New START talks? It appears that the Russians are not embarking on any massive nuclear arms base. So the first issue is that the Americans or, the, or NATO have been able to do is to prevent Russians from actually going or planning anything further other than deciding now how to win the war in Ukraine. But what we've been observing in Ukraine since February 24th of last year uh, can be described as a classic high intensity conflict in which no weapons of mass destruction have been used so far. Hypersonic weapons, supersonic weapons, artillery, but no weapons of mass destruction. Uh, the first, Vladimir Putin's initial hope was to obtain an almost immediate surrender of the Ukrainian president, Zelensky, and put a pro-Russian puppet in place. That didn't happen. The Ukraine's though uh, inferior numbers and armament had clearly learned the Western lessons provided by the NATO trainers over the years. And the Russians found themselves mired in a war in difficult weather conditions, difficult terrain, facing a population that was becoming overwhelmingly hostile and determined not to give up any part of their land. The elder, elderly women, elderly people, the women and children had fled in large numbers, leading the men to fight. Most of Ukraine's 44 million citizens are actually on the move. At least 5.4 million have left. So, if this is the are the miscalculations of the of the of the of the Russians, what are the Russians actually facing? The Ukrainian army, the National Guard, in which many civilians have had joined. After after the extensive reforms that Putin put in after 2008. Russia tested its capabilities in Ukraine in 2014, in Syria in 2015. But both these clashes actually took place according to different dynamics. In Syria, the Russian forces had moved freely, supported by the local dictator, uh, waging war on the rebels in theory, but actually on the whole population. Entire urban areas were raised to the ground. But could Russia do this in Ukraine? Are they actually planning to do that? or as uh, Anil Khosla said that above everything else, the reason why they have not utilized their air power and which has allowed this war to continue for so long is that Russians actually do not want to destroy Ukraine. Uh, Zelensky in the recent days has said that he has no hope of reaching an agreement with President, President Putin and his intention is to fight to the last man to free his country and maintain territorial integrity of Ukraine. So, what are the issues uh, wh when we talk of the attacks on energy infrastructure that are taking place that, and what is going to happen from Belarus? Uh, the issues here are that there are great operational operative difficulties that the Russians have already begun that, that force the Russians to actually call the Wagner, the Wagner force, which is now fighting. Uh, it's a, a mercenary unit scattered throughout the world, especially in the African continent. The notorious Wagner group seems to be increasingly being used to compensate for the losses. And there are persistent rumors that this company is organizing 10 units the size of battalions each. In war, numbers matter, and in irregular war, even more. And men matter more than weapons in irregular war, war in an insurgency situation. Uh, it is estimated that in an insurgency situation, the aggressor needs 10 soldiers for every insurgent, and that too is less. Sometimes even 100 soldiers are, are less. Simple maths show that any counterinsurgency that will finally happen in Ukraine will force the Russians to deploy more and more and more forces in Ukraine. The Russian army at present lacks the means to counter a long rebellion as well it, as it lacks is the motivation and the training. Now, will this conflict be, become irregular? Are the 
Russian forces uh, prepared to face a regular warfare? To my mind, I have no doubt that as Ukraine starts losing more and more territory, uh, the, 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 their armed forces will switch as it happened even in Iraq, that this conflict will become more irregular and the Russians are ill-prepared to face an irregular uh, irregular warfare which can continue interminably. Europe, the Ukraine forces have been trained for 20 years in counterinsurgency uh, in Afghanistan side by side with the NATO forces. The Russian forces who conduct professionally regular operations such as the Wagner Force group are not necessarily capable of managing what could happen inside Ukrainian borders in the coming months, judging from the past results. In Africa, the Wagner force had placed itself at the service of the corrupt regimes. But in Ukraine, the system is absolutely different. It is reported that there is a presence of something like uh, 3,000 plus Russian mercenaries in Ukraine and several have died though the use of uh, these units has great advantage in russia having been declared illegal they pretend not to have any contact with the army or with the government and they're probably better trained to fight in the urban areas so let's just look at the at the issues involved that as the russians start entering the, the built-up areas you will find a problem for the russians to actually try and create for themselves any concept of victory. The reason why I started with the concept of victory is what were the Russians actually looking at? If the Russians from the beginning had decided that victory to them meant removing uh, Zelensky, then it is unlikely that the Russians will win this war. If the Russians have uh, had decided that they will only go till the east of, uh, of the Dnieper River, they will capture the territories of the, 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 the Russian-speaking uh, majority and then stop the war. There is still a chance that they might succeed in that war. But the problem is that even though they had in, come and said that we were looking to liberate the Russian-speaking forces, uh, the Russian-speaking population, they have not been welcomed as liberators in any one of these places. Like I said, it, it's a very nebulous situation. This war can go on indefinitely. And in irregular warfare, unlike uh, what Anil was talking about, the high-tech warfare, uh, in irregular warfare, there is no place for, uh, for any kind of uh, hypersonic or supersonic weapons. Destruction has already taken place. The, you know, mankind has seen irregular warfare over hundreds of years. And it can go on interminably. We've seen, we've had our experience. I've commanded uh, uh, the SM rifles. Thank you, Chair. I'll just take five minutes. Uh, where we've seen that we, though we've been in Nagaland for almost uh, 70 years, there is not no great advantage in taking on any one of the forces or the insurgent groups there. So similarly, they will get trapped in an interminable warfare, which no one can win. So when you talk of situations like this, what is clear is that if Ukraine doesn't lose, she wins. And if Russia doesn't win, then she loses. And finally, the concept of victory. What was Russia's concept of victory? Vis-a-vis -vis the concept of victory of the NATO countries, which are today supporting uh, Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, General. That was absolutely brilliant narrative brought over from the perspective of theory of victory. Actually, this has infused the young ones into thinking as to what are the objectives and what should be the end objective. And you rightly brought out the urban insurgency. There's no experience with the Russian armed forces for that. And that does not need, that's another point of view, hypersonic weapon or something. If that continues, it can remain an irregular warfare forever. And in that, Russia is not so well trained. Very beautifully brought out. These are absolutely stimulating points to trigger the various thoughts in the minds of young ones and all the students who are on the panel thank you very much for your very enlightening uh, uh, talk and that's that's really really wonderful thank you very much thank you now, thank you now is the time to invite the third speaker 
we are rushing through the session because we got less time and there are three more speakers to come up. Uh, the next speaker is Lieutenant General P.R. Shankar. He retired as Director General of Artillery in October 2016. General Shankar has vast operational experience and has held many important command, staff, and instructional appointments in the Army. An alumnus of Defense Services Staff College, Wellington, Army War College, Mao, Naval Postgraduate School, Monterey. Monterey has a tagline where science meets art of warfare. That's a great college to be in. Uh, General and National Defense College Delhi, he gave great impetus to the modernization of artillery through indigenization. I have some personal experience of meeting Sh General Shankar, and he was really on the forefront. I know that personally. That time I was in LNT. He has deep understanding and experience of successful defense planning and acquisition spanning over a decade. He is presently a professor in Aerospace Department of IIT Madras and leads the Tamil Nadu Defense Industrial Corridor. The general writes extensively in all leading publications on strategic, geopolitical, and military issues. He is going to speak on a topic which is called civil military, no better than you to talk about it, fusion and logistic support, lessons from the war. General, all yours. Thank you, sir. Uh, I hope all of you can hear me. Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Uh, but I think there's a right. I'll just change my layout so that. All the mics are muted, so. No, there's some it. problem. I can't see myself. OK. <laughs> can someone else respond? Can you all hear? Yeah, I can see a thumbs up. Yes, sir, I, yes, sir. I, I can't see myself. You have to put on the spotlight or something. Yeah, we can see you very clearly, and you're very loud and clear. Okay, right. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. Uh, thanks for the lovely introduction. At the outset, uh, very good evening to the Indic Research Forum and all those who are uh, listening on to this. I'm going to talk about uh, civil military liaison or rather film, civil military fusion. Uh, and I was asked to speak about logistics, which I'm go not going to speak about because that's not the major issue in this. Right. We've all come to the grand conclusion that future wars are going to be long with a nuclear overhang. And that's a reality which we have to live with. Right. We've also seen over the period of this evening itself, where the four or five speakers who already spoken, including the chair, that a whole of the nation approach is required in case you want to prosecute and win wars. Which means that civil military fusion is needed for the long haul. Right. But then, there's also a lot of talk about the Chinese model of uh, civil military fusion, right? Which I don't definitely agree with because we have to have our own model, right? And the Chinese model of civil military fusion is a communist model which chooses their setup. I've written about it extensively. I've spoken about it. But today, I think there's a, a different dimension which I'm going to speak of, and that's where I'll take you. Uh, it, on reflection, I find that civil military fusion has four facets. The first facet is political military fusion. The second facet is information, strategic communication, and new technology fusion. The third phase is the traditional industrial capacity civil military fusion. And the fourth phase is economic and financial fusion. My speakers before me, including Dr. Ajay Kumar and General Raj Shukla, have indicated upon this, but I'm going to put it in my way. Okay, let's talk about politico military fusion. Politico military fusion is an ongoing affair in the everyday life of a country. It prepares nations for war, it brings about jointness, it brings about fusion in new technologies. It brings about things like recruiting and Agnivir and Agnipath and all for the long term. If that is missing, a lot of things get missing. The second aspect of this political military fusion in war is it is this fusion which decides the aim, terminal objectives, and exit strategies within conflict. Today, what you see is there's an utter lack of exit strategy on any part or a 
not a very clear idea of what where they are going. Okay, you look at it from the Russian viewpoint. You know, the dash to Kiev was all about regime change. But was there maneuver involved in it? It was. Was it executed? No. So obviously, was the Russian military prepared to do that regime change? It wasn't. So when you look at it, there's a gap between how they prepared for this war and how they executed it. And that, to me, is politico-military diffusion. Right. In the second phase of the war, right, like what General Chauhan just referred to, what is the concept of victory, Russian victory? What is their aim? What is their terminal objective? In the case of Ukraine, one is very clear what they are doing. They are defending their homeland, etc. And all that is very clear. But what are they doing for, what is the Russian doing? We don't know. So there is a politico-military, you know, diffusion here again, which is not allowing them to move ahead. Let's look at it from Ukraine. From what one can see in retrospect, Ukraine has emerged, it has emerged that they were preparing for this war from long back. They were probably preparing this war from Minsk 1 and Minsk 2 agreements, right? And they are doing it with complete politico-military fusion. You might question the wisdom of this fusion. That's a different story. Whether they should have gone in for this war or not is a different story. But there is fusion and their oneness about it and they are able to execute it successfully despite the losses they have suffered. It's a big lesson for us that even a loser or a weaker opponent with greater political military fusion can achieve hell of a lot. What about EU, NATO and USA? They were clear from the beginning that they will not get involved in the war but support Ukraine to achieve their objectives. In the end, they are executing a hybrid war to bleed Russia dry. And in that, the political military fusion is complete. Okay, now I'll get to the second part of the story. Information, strategic communication, and new technology in uh, fusion. When you say new technology fusion, I'm talking of space, I'm talking of AI, I'm talking of unmanned systems, robotics, EW, cyber technologies, and semiconductors, which have been spoken about, right, speakers. But I'm putting it in a new paradigm. Right, you've seen in this case, a heavy overload. Everyone has spoken about information operations, battlefield transparency, intelligence, cyber, and drone operations. Who have done it? Largely done through civil, you know, uh, capacities, not army capacities or not armed forces capacities. What about narrative building? Someone said the narratives by Ukraine have been very good, right? And that's what was referred to by Dr. Ajay Kumar. Damn good, but who did it? It is the civilian infrastructure. Are we capable of doing it tomorrow? Big question mark. Because you've not put the structures in place to do this narrative building or fuse these structures together. I, to quote an example, uh, we have one of the largest uh, you know, organizations which can do this in the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting. But it is, is it fused with the Ministry of Defense? Big question mark. Right. And then there's a huge amount of civil capacity from Microsoft with AI, SpaceX, Starlink, Amazon with cloud computing, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which has been repurposed for military you know, purposes in this into Ukraine, not even USA, into Ukraine. And this was referred to by General Raj Shukla. So the here again you see a civil military you know fusion. In fact, I've referred to this in my, uh, you know, talks on civil, you know, mil military technologies of this century, which are available on the YouTube. Please go to the Gunner Shot channel and you'll find a whole series on which I'm suggesting how to do this uh, civil military fusion. Then, of course, you have a whole lot of dual purposes technologies, which are ideal for civil military fusion. All right. In the normal conditions, they flood the market. But if repurposed, can be used for military purposes. And that is what this war has taught us. Okay, now let us talk to the industrial fusion, about industrial fusion, which when, when you talk of civil military fusion, this is what comes to your mind. Now you look to the last century, this is the capability of the last century. Civil military fusion is not a you know Nobel Prize kind of a revelation by Chinese, right? The US and the Soviet Russia had this capability for the last century. 
they fused their civil and military industries to defeat germans and japanese in the second world war right russia continued with its huge industrial capacity to sustain its war effort in fact it repurposed its war capacity of that time to you know uh, you know sustain its military as also exports now what has this export capability done that export capability today you, if you see they're not exporting they're not even exporting arms ammunition nothing what are they doing this additional export cap capability is a search capability which russia has created which is now coming into use to sustain its war whereas the western nations are struggling you find that the russian russia is not even taking a deep breath about fielding new weapons and expanding ammunition right though reports do come how good they are is a big question mark but the lesson is you have to go into exports create surge capacities at time of war that is the spare capacity which you need to use for funding your uh, you know war and in peace time the defense exports are what you're going to earn money for you to fund your military is this kind of a thinking there in india i don't think so right and i'm sure i've opened a new way of thinking on this issue but the, it, this is not the end of the story there is an issue of economic and financial fusion which i want to put across look very clearly russia has been preparing for this eventually for eventuality for a quite of some time it knew that the sanctions were going to come it had a plan to sidestep sanctions it had a diplomatic plan it had an economic plan and a political plan to sidestep sanctions and leave the military to continue with prosecuting war okay it has also been able to financially withstand the uh, cost of war since it owns the technology i have always believed that owning technology is the cheapest way of funding your own you know security capability right apart from earning money so atmanirbharta has a dual purpose for which we have to think differently right i have we been able to do that okay now the need for atmanirbharta everyone knows but you need to think it strategically it just not having atmanirbharta and being self sufficient it gives you sustenance during war it gives you the ability to side step during war atmanirbharta will enable you to wean away from dependence on chinese imports on strategic issues what if tomorrow if you have a war with china and china imposes curbs on its exports to india will you be able to side step it do you have capacities in place to do that have you foreseen your your conflict paradigm with china and fuse it with your industrial capacity and atmanirbharta program to ensure that you don't get caught with over dependence on china these are questions which we have to really think the civil, the chinese civil military fusion model is a dumb model if i may say so right i have i have analyzed it i have spoken about it and this is probably the 10th or 12th forum i'm talking on civil military fusion and this reflection has told made me speak like this okay now let us see what is there in our context in our context it is not as if civil military fusion didn't take place if you take the 1971 war it is the fantastic and probably the best example of civil military fusion in all four facets we also liberated a country in 14 days and created a country which 70 years later today is a thriving country half a century later not 70 years half a century later is a thriving country right and pakistan looks to that country to say bhai hum kyun aise na rahe okay so you have to think differently for this civil military fusion we have our own example okay i let me put it back i'll take my mind back to 2019 in 2019 the prime minister highlighted the need of a future ready force at a combined commanders conference at that time he spoke of shedding legacy systems and practices he spoke of holistic approach focused on breaking down on civil military silos and expediting the speed of decision making beyond weapon procurement these are his exact words i have reproduced them in an article of mine in 2019 i said look at this man he is looking ahead for india right but can i if i examine it today in today's context what do i see you heard the finance minister give out her budget very recently right what does it say 
your capex has gone up from 2.7% of last year to 3.53% of the gdp and the way the gdp is going and as per economists this is likely to shoot up to 4.5% fantastic okay but it also emphasizes on technology upgradation in, which includes disruptive technologies ai robotics unmanned semiconductors all this was spoken on the floor of the house and i am quoting from her budget speech great but look at it the defense outlay is barely 2% of the gdp for the past 5 years it has not changed is this indicative of a rising india and if our gdp and goes as per it and if our growth rate takes as per that this 2% will dip right what does it indicate there is no convergence of any kind the defense outlay is going down your national outlay in all other sectors is going up is there a convergence mentioned in your uh, way you have uh, growing your disruptive technologies no and we have all the while spoken today that you want fusion if your national policy is doesn't and you know our budget contains our national policy virtually this is our way of you know putting out a national policy if our national policy is silent on it what civil military fusion are we talking of a big question mark for all of us i'll give you one more question uh, i'll give you one more uh, example india held the aero india show you know 2023 it was all about military aircraft in re very recently in jan 2024 we are going to have wings india 2024 in hyderabad that is all going to be about civil aircraft and civil aviation we must be the only country in the world which has two air shows within one year right with military and civil separately it doesn't happen in fan bro it doesn't happen in the uh, paris air show it doesn't happen in dubai are we even thinking of civil military fusion right and this is in public domain if our national leaders don't talk of civil military fusion why are we talking of it is there a logic right right in the past 3 months or 4 months in fact i spoke on civil military fusion in a conference from usa online like this that was about 4 5 months back and i felt very happy that civil military fusion is being spoken of in the past 3 months all talk has been on one side the side which matters most and drive which is required to drive civil military fusion from the top has been missing so there's a lot of you know national consciousness which has to be built into for civil military fusion to come about it is not wish listing i am grateful to indic research that a forum which spans everyone from the youth to the civil sector has taken the subject up to talk right i am grateful to all of you and i am thankful and i'll take on any questions after the, at this end of the uh, you know whole evening thanks and jai hind Uh, sir, you are on mute. Thank you, General Shankar. That was very timely and very professor-like prioritization of the civil-military fusion in all its aspects. And I really appreciate your compassionate push that on all forums we talk about it and we really make it a national mission. And as you rightly brought out, the political-military fusion. is going to be one of the very important and telling effect on our national security as to how are we aligned and as you said and probably brought out very clearly for the young ones here that national policies manifest your civil military fusion and the contrast you can see that there is a civil air show and there is a military air show while the technologies across the board are very very common and you rightly said that if you harness the technologies and you own the technologies the cost of national security cost of conflict and your search capability will just come thereby thank you very much uh, it's really uh, a point to ponder over for the young generation and for the indic researcher forum to keep it an issue for all the other seminars to come up now my time is to invite uh, general uh, general rs panwar uh he is was commissioned into the indian army 
Corps of Signals in 1976. He has commanded two logistics formations, an electronic warfare brigade, and the Military College of Telecommunication in Jenny. He is a graduate of National Defense College and has been awarded a doctoral degree in computer science as well as a distinguished alumnus award by IIT Bombay. He is a distinguished fellow with USI of India and is engaged in evolving strategic thought and in international track two dialogues in the area of disruptive military technology, in particular information operations and artificial intelligence that's so relevant and has been talked about so much on this forum. General, we'll be talking about cyber and information warfare lessons from the war. General, I invite you over to give your talk, please. Thanks very much, uh, ABM Shrivastav. And thanks to Intech Researchers Forum for having me over here. Uh, I hope uh, I am being heard properly. Yeah, you are you're audible and very clear, General. Thank you. So let me be somewhat of an exception and uh, do my presentation using a PowerPoint uh, slides for a change. Please so I'll share my slides. So I suppose they're visible now. Yeah, slides have come, they're visible. Uh, somebody from audience can also say so. Yes, sir, visible. Yes, sir, yes, sir, the screen is visible. Thank you, thank you. Righto. So one of the reasons for going in for slide was to pack in a little more than uh, just verbal things can do in 15 minutes. And uh, so let me also try and speak fast, but I've seen that all the speakers have stuck to time. I must also stick to this 15 minutes. I just noticed there's a five minutes gap between one and the other. And we are starting right on time. Okay, 1755. So now, before I give out my views on cyber and information warfare, and there have been some references by earlier speakers to this in the Russia-Ukraine war, I would like to build some perspective for this important facet of modern warfare. Now, what we are talking of here uh, fits in very nicely under the overall framework of non-kinetic warfare. All warfare, kinetic and non-kinetic, is waged by a nation by leveraging its comprehensive national power, was referred to by an earlier speaker, and CNP is quite nicely captured by the dime paradigm, which is also referred to, uh, which is indicated on the slide. Here, the military component reflects the kinetic element, while the diplomatic information and economic realms are non-kinetic in flavor. And we are observing all four elements playing out in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. The subject of my talk leads to the information component of DIME. Now, the Indian Army, uh, and I'm sure the other two services doctrine, refer to information warfare as a combination of three elements, cyber operations, electronic warfare, and psychological operations. And I'll be dwelling briefly in all the three components. And I also prefer to use the term cognitive operations instead of psyops or even the more colloquial narrative warfare, which has been referred to by earlier speakers too. I prefer cognitive operations. The impact of each of these three elements is being felt in this ongoing conflict. Now, this slide brings out the differences amongst these three elements, because at times there is a subject of confusion in a very simple manner. The weapon in the case of electronic warfare is EM energy, which targets electronics and machines. For cyber operations, it's a piece of malicious code which targets data and software. And for psychological and cognitive operations, it is the message which is designed to create effects in minds. Uh, just some theory, uh, for but uh, just so that we don't confuse what the three are. Now, is non-kinetic warfare effective? To answer this question, before talking about Ukraine, I would like to flag a few notable examples of non-kinetic operations which have resulted in strategic effects globally during the last 10-15 years. Firstly, in 2010, we know Stuxnet destroyed 20% of Iran's uh, nuclear centrifuges causing substantial damage to its nuclear program, the first known cyber attack with strategic effects. 
In 2015, the Russian attack on Ukraine's electrical grid disrupted supply to a quarter million citizens for several hours, the first recorded cyber attack on critical infrastructure. The 2021 ransomware attack on the US colonial pipeline, which carries 45% of oil fuel to the US East Coast, resulted in its shutdown for almost a week. And in fact, emergency was declared in 17 states, US states. It was widely believed that the Russian cognitive operations were responsible for Hillary Clinton losing to Donald Trump in the 2016 US presidential elections. Though recently there have been reports which refute this claim. If it happened, it's something like a regime change through cognitive operations. Let us now turn to the Ukraine conflict. The cyber attacks and counterattacks, uh, and first we am talking of cyber operations. So the cyber attacks and counterattacks in the ongoing operations have been dubbed as the first global cyber war. Let me give out some details. There were several cyber attacks during the buildup to the special military operation. In Jan 2022, the destructive malware Whispergate attacked IT infrastructure of industries, government, IT organizations, destroying storage devices. Again, in February 2020, uh, 20, on 23rd February, just before launch of the operation, another sophisticated Viper ma malware called Hermetic Viper affected hundreds of Ukrainian machines. Then in synchronization with the launch of the operation, the telecom provider Triolan, which served the armed forces also, was attacked on 24th Feb. And then on 9th March, a very severe cyber attack disabled tens of thousands of satellite models of the European Viasat satellite network, which in addition to its effects in Ukraine, rendered thousands of German wind turbines ineffective as well. So it went across the borders. As a counter on 26th Feb, uh, the Ukrainian Minister for Digital Transformation gave a call on Telegram network for raising an IT army. Very unique thing. A target list was also posted on Telegram. Within a month or so, several lakh volunteers from across the globe joined this ad hoc army. The US Cyber Command and major American technology providers, including Amazon, Google, and Microsoft, continue to play a major role in fending off Russian cyber attacks in Ukraine. However, it is true that once the bullets and bombs started dominating the battle space, the efficacy of cyber attacks towards affecting the course of battle receded into the background. But it would be safe to say that cyber warfare has played a significant role in Russia-Ukraine war, much more so than in any previous all-out conflict. And this is likely to increase further in the battles to come. Now, in the initial phase of the operation, Russian electronic warfare was not very effective despite its reputed expertise in this area and its formidable EW systems. These include the Krasuka 2 and 4 anti-radar systems, the layer 3 communication jamming systems, amongst others. They are many. Russia's five EW brigades are equipped with all major EW systems and each Russian maneuver brigade includes an EW company with about 100 men using smaller systems like the Zytel. Now, Russian EW is now becoming very effective. Presently, at least three Russian, uh, three of the Russian five EW brigades are engaged in Ukraine. Krasuka 4 is being used to jam radars on Ukrainian drones, such as uh, the Turkish Beretta TB2. And according to a RUSI, that's the think tank, report of December 2022, 90% of the thousands of drones which Ukraine owned before operations commenced were destroyed by Russian directed energy weapons by summer of last year. This is a recent report. But Ukraine is fighting back using counter drone systems provided by the United States. The Ukrainian troops too have downed hundreds of uh, Russian drones and are also jamming Russian communications. Moreover, using US systems, they are also able to detect transmissions from Russian EW systems and direct rocket artillery and drone counterattacks against them. Now, as we are aware, and a lot has been spoken by earlier speakers also, cognitive operations are being conducted by both sides in a major way over broadcast as well as social media platforms. The narratives being propagated by the collective West vis-a-vis -vis Russia are almost completely divorced in content, making it extremely difficult to ascertain the correct situation on the ground. For instance, both sides seem to assert emphatically that their victory is certain in the long term, 
Of course, it also depends on how you define victory, as some people have spoken. Now, on February 27th, uh, just when their operations were launched, the EU President Ursula von der Leyen announced the banning of both Russia Today and Sputnik from within the European Union. In retaliation, in March, Russia blocked BBC and other news sites and also enacted, enacted a law against publishing fake news. The situation was similar on social media platforms. Uh, on February 28th, Meta blocked Russia Today and Sputnik also from Facebook and Instagram. In retaliation, Russia banned Facebook, then Twitter. Russia also took a number of steps for restricting free flow of information over the internet, akin to those which power the Great Firewall of China. A number of other similar steps have also been taken by both camps. So the following may be summarized about the execution of non-kinetic warfare in the Ukraine conflict so far. Cyber operations have been conducted by both sides on a massive scale, but have failed to achieve long-term strategic effects. Electronic warfare operations have had a remarkable impact at the tactical level. Finally, cognitive warfare has been played out very vigorously and effectively by both sides. Lessons drawn from the Ukraine conflict need to be translated to the Indian context. And for that, we have to first identify our own vulnerabilities, especially vis-a-vis -vis our primary adversary, China. Let me throw some light on some of these by painting some scenarios. Firstly, critical infrastructure, cyber attacks. During mobilization phase, electrical grids, rail networks, and banks may be disrupted by Chinese cyber attacks. Is it feasible? Well, recent cyber attacks on India's critical infrastructure include the attack on Mumbai's electrical grid in October 2020 and the targeting of Ladakh's electrical grid last year. Both are believed to have originated in China. There is a very high probability that Chinese malware has already gained footholds in our critical information infrastructure. Satellite segment during mobilization as well as conflict stages, our satellite segment, given its limited redundancy, may be rendered ineffective by the PLA strategic support force using EW, laser, cyber, hyper microwave, and co-orbital capabilities, all of which are being vigorously pursued by China. Potent vehicle-based powerful jammers placed well forward could have a devastating effect on our combat communications, especially during mechanized op operations, wherever they are feasible. Drone-based jammers can also be effective to be available to the PLA at tactical levels. China's intent to achieve EW dominance is amply demonstrated by the fact that it has raised firstly the strategic support force where cyber, EW, cognitive and space has all been integrated into one force and is allocating billions of dollars towards developing EW technologies. During the build-up and conflict stages, uh, China is expected to carry out cognitive operations to win the narrative war on the international stage, weaken national will, and lower the morale of our armed forces. Use of what might happen may, uh, may be taken from its cognitive operations during the Doklam and Galwan crisis. Should India decide to do so, we too could exploit societal, religious, and ethnic fault lines in Pakistan and China, for example, Gil Gilgit, Pakistan, etc., or Uyghurs, to carry out offensive cognitive operations against our adversaries. There is another important facet of cognitive warfare which I would like to flag, namely the employment of neuro weapons. While disinformation as a weapon targets the content of the brain, Neuro weapons may be used to target the brain itself. And this is achieved by leveraging what is known as NBIC technologies. NBIC stands for, as indicated, Nano Bio uh, Information Technology and Cognitive. And tremendous amount of resources are being devoted to develop these weapons by China, NATO, and others. There's a brain project of uh, China which is on. Now, what let me offer some recommendations how India might move forward to build up uh, its capabilities for fighting informationized wars in the 21st century, commencing with cyber operations. As per the Belfer Cyber Power Index, which is uh, the only proper index existing today, 
China is ranked at number two and India at number 21 amongst 30 aspiring global cyber powers. And in offensive cyber operations, China is at number three and India at number 25. The world's top cyber powers are well ahead of India in terms of organizations. The US cyber, com US cyber Command was raised way back in 2010. China raised its strategic support since 2015. And Russia and the UK too have well-structured cyber establishments. In comparison, India's cyber strategy is yet to be promulgated. Of course, is expected soon. In terms of organizations, we have the certain and the National Critical Information Infrastructure Protection Center or NCIPC, but both are essentially advisory bodies and limited offensive cyber capabilities exist with the NTRO, the Defense Cyber Agency and the DRDO. So in my view, offensive cyber operations should be conducted under exclusive control of the armed forces. The Defense Cyber Agency should be upgraded to a cyber command. I think Colonel General Shukla also uh, stated the same. And we must train offensive cyber warriors and transform our HRD policies in order to develop this highly specialist expertise. Coming to cognitive operations, in comparison to India, China's strategic support force and Pakistan's ISPR possess very significant capabilities for carrying out cognitive warfare. They are both uh, military organizations, as indicated on the slide. Uh, here in the ISPR, there are 4,000 people with a, with, a, with a budget of several thousand crores per year. That's the type of capability which Pakistan pushes into ISPR. So in my view, India needs to evolve a potent apex level organization for conducting cognitive warfare. And the armed forces must develop requisite expertise as well. And also raise a defense cognitive operations agency. Uh, you can name it anything. I mean, this is a generic name. Moreover, there is a good case for the Ministry of Defense to play a pivotal role in the con uh, conduct of cognitive operations. Uh, we must also vigorously pursue the development of neuro weapons. Finally, a few words on developing EW capabilities. With the advent of 5G, proliferation of sensors, the imperative of developing counter space and counter UAV technologies, and the pursuit of operational concepts such as multi-domain operations and joint operations, which require reliable wireless networking, the impact of EW on warfare is increasing by the day. In the Indian context, EW resources are scarce, equipment is not fully state-of-the-art, and existing HRD policies do not adequately support the desired level of specialization. So in my view, the quantum of army EW units and formations need to be scaled up from EW brigade per command to EW brigade per corps. And equipment means urgent upgradation to keep, keep pace with the state of art communication technologies. Skill development, special focus needs to be given to skill development, especially in offensive cyber operations and cognitive disciplines. It is imperative to create centers of excellence and civilian expertise must be tapped as needed through innovative HR techniques. So in conclusion, I would like to state that organizational changes being proposed here by me amount to increase of only a few thousand personnel, something like 15 to 20,000 in our 1.4 million armed forces. If our armed forces are to develop adequate capabilities for conducting non-kinetic warfare across the spectrum of conflict, somebody mentioned, uh, Air Master Khosla mentioned gray zone operations. Such a trade-off in manpower from the kinetic to the information and cognitive realms is clearly warranted. I finish here. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. And I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you, General Pramod. That was really erudite uh, presentation and we thank you for giving PowerPoint presentation because your topic was a little complex and the way it came out, it became so simple for the audience. I guess all the young ones who are on the forum, they would have really learned what are the imperatives, why we need to go into non kinetic operations and they are going to, you can do an osmosis kind of thing from kinetic operations, you can take out few thousands and put them into non kinetic operations without even disturbing the budget. But your focus has to be there. 
And the three parts which you made out and so clearly spelled out electronic warfare, cyber warfare, and the cognitive warfare. And what are the elements of these? It was really very, very explicit and very clear. And one thing which really remarkably takes our attention, brain will be the next battlefield, battlefield of the future. And then you talk about the NBIC, absolutely brilliant. This becomes the thought for future seminars also to talk about. And I hope your guidance would be available. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. And I can see on the margins that people are taking on the questions and the speakers are answering them. That gives chair uh, less responsibility to allow. Of course, at the end of the session, we'll talk, ask them in case they have any more questions. Now, let me take this opportunity to invite the next speaker. And our next speaker is Major General Dr. B. S. B. Asthana. And uh, he is a globally acknowledged strategic and security analyst. PhD from JNU, that's great, sir, and has authored over 450 publications. Brilliant number. Veteran infantry general with 45 years of experience at national and varied international fields. Held various key appointments in Army and United Nations. Director courses, USI of India, the oldest think tank of India. He's a TV commentator. I know that in person also. Speaker in various strategic military forums, UN organizations, think tanks, and universities. Currently on Governing and Security Council Feder Confederation of Education Excellence, International Organization of Education Development, and other UN organizations on advisory board of global advisors, consultants, cooperation, corporation, IOED, representative in UN headquarters, Vienna, Austria. Distinguished expert, Bharat Center of Canada. He's also advisor, MIT University, Bharat Media, LLC, USA, former member, expert group challenges forum, Sweden, awarded twice by President of India, twice by UN, CE Excellence Award for Nation Building by Governor of Haryana. Awarded for international diplomacy and global conflict resolutions by IOED twice, a consultative body for ECOSOC and International Police Commission, IPC India, by former Prime Minister of Moldova. How do you get so much of time, sir? Anyway, our topic for you today is ground assessment of the ongoing conflict and future ahead. Actually, future ahead is one such topic that the whole set of audience are looking at it. What's the future ahead? That's a very intriguing point, and you're most welcome to speak about it. Sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, team of FinTech Research Forum, Mr. Rishas Arya, uh, for inviting me for the, uh, for this seminar, and uh, also thanks to all the co-panelists who have given very illuminating talk, which was very educative. Uh, being the last speaker of the session, I'll try and not repeat anything what has been said, and. Like uh, what General Panwar mentioned, I too, to save on time, uh, will show the current situation, as you said, ground situation on the map. So uh, just three, four maps I, I would share. Uh, I think there is some problem. I'll I'll leave that. Uh, firstly, your uh, pardon me. Your slides are with the uh, Indic Researchers Forum. Can they present? I don't think so. I don't think they you can share it on WhatsApp mail. We can present it uh, while you. No, no, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. We won't waste that time. We won't waste that much of time. I don't think we should. We should waste that much of time. We'll uh, slides are. Uh, it's okay uh, without. Uh, uh, I, I'll. <laughs> I'm as it is used to speaking extempore. Those slides are basically the maps, four maps as to how the situation is. Uh, firstly. As far as the ground situation is concerned, India has not achieved its strategic aim. The strategic aim, so many people said so many things, but let me be very clear. The strategic aim was to, del uh, to liberate or to capture now, capture Donbass, create a southern corridor to connect Crimea, and 
land of Ukraine by taking this corridor further to Transnistria. That was their aim. Why did they go to Kiev? Uh, there are many theories. Firstly, uh, they thought that with the shock and awe effect, maybe that Zelensky will give in. So that was first miscalculation. That didn't happen. Secondly, uh, it was also a turning moment because the defenses against Donbass were very strong and therefore a turning moment to threaten Kyiv, which is a depth objective, also released some pressure against Donbass and therefore they were able to make some gains. So that was a strategic movement as which we call in army a turning movement. The second issue was in Kherson, uh, correction, Kharkiv, there was another strategic mistake. Uh, they thought that it's a Russian uh, speaking population, but Kharkiv is not that badly troubled by Ukrainians as the people of Donbass are. And therefore, in Kharkiv, they met a different response what they thought, and therefore it didn't work that way. But their main aim was exactly what I said. Now, if you see, uh, I couldn't show you the maps, but the fact is that if you see and compare the scene uh, which is being shown in the BBC or Al Jazeera uh, websites, uh, if you see this, uh, uh, then they have not reached uh, their strategic objective by any stretch of imagination. They are unlikely to reach because of uh, the kind of residual combat power which they are left with. And therefore, there is a problem there. Now, why? what happened during, uh, there were certain mistakes, some were pointed out, but some more I must point out that Russian army was prepared for maneuver warfare. They faced an attrition warfare. That didn't work out in their favor. Secondly, uh, they did not do the terrain study properly. That one kilometer long convoy, that was actually not supposed to happen had they read the uh, terrain properly. Uh, secondly, uh, their logistics was very poor. They have rail-based logistics and it doesn't work. We do, they don't have uh, things like what we have, the uh, core axis of maintenance and div axis of maintenance and things like that. They don't have such comp uh, uh, the concepts and therefore they suffered there as well. So that was another uh, mistake which they had. Uh, the third thing which was that many people read uh, Russians counteroffensive as uh, they would, uh, Russian uh, correction, the Ukrainians counteroffensive that Russians withdrew from Kherson. Now, uh, when Russians had captured Kherson, the problem was that you can't be both sides of the river. Militarily, it is not viable. Then you have lesser infantry. With lesser infantry, you can't hold long uh, townships, which is a built up area. So the terrain friction of built up areas were not allowing them to really remain there. And then you have a hostile population. And therefore, it made better sense that you withdraw and come to the own side of the uh, river, and which they have done uh, as of now. So this was in nutshell, but notwithstanding that, because of these miscalculations, because of uh, the higher air defense environment and things like that, Russians did lose a fair amount of equipment and material. And it is taking a, a, a big, uh, shall I say, hit. Uh, to their strategic planning as well as to their progression of operations. Uh, now, there are certain stark realities which both sides are refusing to accept. The first one is that uh, we, we all know that uh, uh, Ukraine happens to be the uh, big power contestation area. Uh, the actual war, the kinetic contact hybrid war may be between Russia and Ukraine, uh, but uh, the US-led NATO is waging a undeclared, non-kinetic, non-contact warfare in many domains like economic, information, diplomatic, political, and, and many others. Now, uh, the stark reality is that Russia with largest number of nuclear arsenal cannot be annihilated. That's one stark reality which everybody understands. Secondly, and before they feel, because there is a rhetoric to say that you Putin must lose. Before Putin loses or before Putin replaces, one, one of such nuke will be used. So this is one stark reality which people have to, uh, which people are afraid of, but they are hesitant in accepting it. The second stark reality is that US will not risk any relation of Washington stroke New York to save either Ukraine or also Poland. It, despite it being a NATO uh, member. Thirdly, uh, Russia will not be able to annihilate Ukraine completely if NATO support continues. 
so that's also a reality and uh, given the uh, Re uh, the U eu has to accept that reality that they did not pay attention to russian uh, security concerns they followed american line they uh, the american line was to disrupt the energy flow and they have la laid themselves in the trap they also did not prepare for a hostile russia uh, after second world war and today they are paying a price because some most of their sovereign decisions are not being taken by them and uh, most of them are not in their interest also there is a unfortunate uh, case wherein uh, the national interest is not being played up as of now the war is continuing because of interest of certain entities now what are these entities these are warlords these are energy companies these are political masters in us who feels whether uh, the continuance of war is giving them a better chance for the next election or otherwise so this is the situation as far as uh, the current situation as far as the conflict is concerned now there have been various various miscalculations let me just enumerate some of them as far as russians are concerned uh, their calculation is still based on one premise that nato will stop short of nuclear escalation and therefore a nato a, a nuclear threat is credible and that has proved because nato has not put even one soldier on ground and they have stopped short of it what they did not calculate was uh, that they thought that perhaps uh, they will be able to gain a lot by freezing uh, europe in winters uh, win europe has survived uh, with the energy cuts so i think that is a currency which has been expanded uh, also uh, there was a miscalculation uh, that uh, they thought that ukraine will not be able to defend itself but then that did, did not prove that well uh, similarly now what they are trying is that they must gain maximum uh, position uh, for a better negotiation uh, table uh, on uh, to on the better uh, on the table uh, in a manner uh, that they have hiked up and they have made uh, their offensive a little more aggressive on the uh, eastern side uh, bakhmut is a case uh, if they get it perhaps they will be able to hike up a little more to space it a little more and they want to do it before the fresh tanks and the fresh arsenal which has been provided or promised and the fresh offensive weapons are effective now that is what they are looking at uh, they feel that the energy grid uh, targeting energy grid is is workable and it is legitimate perfectly leg legitimate if the uh, nord stream 1 and 2 can be blown off and if uh, their bridge can be blown off and if the information warfare can be played to uh, to for rest of the world to believe that russia blew its own pipeline and it blew its own bridge also Uh, and the whole world should uh, accept that i don't think that is possible because simar harsh has got a different opinion and so has many others uh, and in fact uh, i had one of the slide to show you uh, wherein the location where this uh, pipeline has been blown off is such that it is very near the western countries and the us allies so there was no way that any other uh, group could have done it it has been uh, i am very certain uh the maximum beneficiary of this has been usa and the jubilation of blinken immediately after uh, the blowing off of the pipeline uh, confirms that uh, as far as nato is concerned they want the war to be confined in ukraine only because they fear that if something happens in poland or any of these countries they run into a risk either you go in for nuclear war or you shy away from meeting your nato commitment and both of them are a very major problem and that is why they are uh, uh, deliberating so much in giving the aircrafts and things like that and also making the ukrainian defense minister say that no it is only for our defense it will not be used in russian territory because they don't want to escalate so that's another issue uh they also miscalculated the economic resilience of russia because Uh, as of now russian economy is doing much better european economy is much uh, lower as far as the gdp growth is concerned same is the case with usa and uk is in minus anyway so that is another issue where the problem is uh, also uh, uh, in fact immediately after this i am i am to speak on a 
uh, another seminar on, on of USA uh, where they are saying that have they created a Vietnam like situation for Russia? Yes, the situation, the answer is yes, because in this particular case, what is going to happen is and combining it with what you mentioned uh, that what is going to happen in future, nobody will win completely. Nobody will lose completely. Every side will lose. Who will lose less is the uh, is the order of the day. The geography of Ukraine has been changed forever. It, it is not going to change much because the stalemate situation remains. The uh, residual capacity of both sides is not as much because for a, making a significant offensive gains, uh, you require much better ratios which you norm, which you don't have. So therefore, what is going to happen is uh, that uh, there will be a little bit of territory transfer uh, and nothing very much is going to happen. But Russia will get embroiled with a tremendous amount of irregular warfare, insurgency, proxy war, and uh, the holding that territory which they have captured uh, will become a problem. So therefore, this is a Vietnam kind of situation because Vietnam, USA had to face it for 20 years. Now they have taken some uh, learning from what uh, seeing McFate had to say when he said that uh, 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 West is losing all wars because they haven't understood the strategy and they say that it's a shadow war and in shadow war people don't matter. So for USA, people of Ukraine don't matter. So that is why they want that it should be fought till the last Ukrainian ally. But and also a situation is in their favor in a manner that they have to fight it without the body bag, without the burden of body bag. So if you have a villain Zelensky, whom they have packed up as a uh, uh, doing all the heroics in, of this world, and if he is willing to risk uh, whatever was mentioned, uh, so many refugees and so many uh, IDPs and things like that. Uh, so if he is ready to do that, then it suits Russia, uh, it, it suits America. And therefore, all these entities want uh, that their weapons should be tested. It's a good testing ground. It's a... Uh, uh, the, the Europe is forced to buy more weapons now. They have no choice. Uh, they will all uh, have permanent uh, foe as, as as Russia. They will also have internal uh, security problems because all these mercenaries, the, the jihadis, uh, uh, they are uh, they are never dead. Once a jihadi is always a jihadi, they will go back and fight that in Europe too. So Europe will never be stable. And most of the refugees which have gone from Ukraine, they may may not remain, uh, they may may not come back. So that is the kind of risk which these people are carrying. So, and another thing which uh, is a wild card entry of China. Uh, now both sides fear. Uh, both sides are fearing that China, in case it enters war or it give, starts giving lethal weapons, then there is a very serious problem and the balance will swing. And that is why uh, USA is giving all kinds of. Uh, uh, mild threats, they know that they can't do very much to China, uh, depend, given the dependent kind of dependency they have, that okay, we will sanction you, we will do this, that, etc. But, uh, and I think Chinese have also given a suitable reply to say that, how is it that your refueling war is, is, is genuine and my refueling war is not genuine, although I may do it, may not do it, because China has economic interest and their economic interests are little more uh, than their interests in uh, Russia itself. So that's a uh, that's a major issue. As far as uh, the future is concerned, as I mentioned, uh, the what is being thought of is uh, that uh, as far as the Ukraine territory is concerned, as I said, nothing very much is going to change. But uh, what NATO is trying is that if Finland uh, and uh, 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 if, and uh, Sweden they join them, then the you, uh, the uh, NATO border. Uh, they get the, firstly they secure their northern flank. They will also be able to secure Atlantic because Russia, China is a major threat to Atlantic too, and uh, Russia will face a very major problem because they will have to lump this despite a victory or so-called victory or so-called territorial gains. Uh, they will have to lump the fact that their border has been increased by 1,000 kilometers. So that is where perhaps uh, the situation is going to end. Uh, that's what I visualize. Uh, otherwise, we all have to wait and see as to how it pans out. Uh, back to you, Chair. Thank you, General Asthana. That was, uh, in fact, <laughs> one of the boldest and direct comment on the uh, on the warfare or the Russia-Ukraine war, which is going on. You brought out all all the points, whether it was the political point for the U.S. 
or the US hegemony to continue and everybody contributing and European, uh, you know, uh, the, the, you know, economic conditions and everything going for a hit downward. And as you rightly pointed out, I would say it's a food for thought that why certain, you know, kind of uh, miscalculations happened. It was set of miscalculation on both the sides. Whether it was about Kharkiv, it was about Donbass, it was about Southern Corridor and no access, then you had to do. But I think as what picture you have given, that in future, this is for all of us to know that in future, some territorial gains will happen to Russia as the end game. But these territorial gains will have a lot of pains along with it because there will be some kind of uh, urban insurgency and to contain that, a lot of forces will remain tied down there. And when it comes to US-led NATO and their gains, of course, in Atlantic, probably they'll have a little more better foothold with Finland and Sweden coming into the play towards the NATO side. But the fear is on both sides. And fear is the key, probably that will decide an end to this war or a Vietnam-like situation as you have already uh, you know, forecast. Thank you very much for your very uh, bold and very direct and very simple insight into the war and the way it's going to end up. Thanks a lot. And with this, this session comes to an end. And if there are any questions, I think they are to be taken up on the chat box. Uh, Yashas, how are we, how we planned the next thing? Uh, sir, we have a few questions lined up. So Satya, if you can kindly read these questions to the respected uh, speakers. Uh, that. Yes, sir. Sir, I think few of our answers are already, a few of the questions are already answered. Should I just ignore them? Ah, you can take them. Uh, there's no point. You can take them uh, again. So if uh, the speakers want to answer, then uh, we can have them. Okay. Okay. Then the first question is for uh, uh, Air Marshal Anil Osla, sir, from Argeesh. Uh, okay. Okay. We have our first question for Lieutenant General Raj Shukla, sir. And sir is not with us. So I you can ask the question. We can answer. That's not an issue. Uh, no, it was about uh, uh, suggest some books on theater command of India. Uh, there are many articles as far as the books are concerned. I think there are a whole lot of articles on uh, uh, the theater command. Uh, I think uh, uh, there are some books too, but this is a developing story and a developing subject. And therefore, my suggestion is uh, that you keep yourself current on the articles because every time a new thing comes up, uh, the dimension changes. Uh, yes, we are stuck as far as theatrization is concerned in some manner or the other uh, for various reasons. Uh, and uh, the, one of the reasons is the paucity of resources as well as uh, uh, especially the air resources. And therefore, uh, distribution of those resources and uh, make it slightly difficult for us to undertake certain national tasks which can become a problem so therefore uh, this model is yet to be adopted since it is evolving i suggest articles are a better option anybody can add or uh, agree disagree whatever okay you can go ahead with the next question right. thank you sir we have a next question for air marshal anil kosla sir uh, sir we have seen the increasing usage of cheap drones in the war can we expect the use of swarm drones in the future for overwhelming the anti-aircraft system and radar? Yeah, uh, thank you. It's a very live question. And uh, yeah, drones, as you've seen in this uh, war also, they're being utilized, you know, in a big way for various tasks. And actually, drone, you know, we use it as a very generic term. Drones are different, different types, you know, very big drones, which can carry heavy load, which can operate for uh, days altogether and have very long range to small quadcopter type of uh, uh, things which have got limited uh, capacity limited range and uh, then the tasks are different you know whether you can do it isr or you can do it can range from isr to going into physical attack the armed uh, drones so it's a big subject and it's a big uh, and it is in the civil world also the application is increasing and the good dra good drone bad drone story is also on you know it lands up in the wrong hands what will happen uh, so this is a very very vast subject and uh, 
coming specific to your question definitely the drones usage in the war as well as in the gray zone operations is going to increase it's already happening actually you know you keep hearing stories of uh, across the border small drones coming in and dropping in contraband and some weapons and things like that so it's going to increase uh, quite a bit and while the drone industry is increasing the anti drone industry is also coming up where the systems are because of the various features of the drone you know some of them have got a very very low signatures of noise radar and engine and other things so you have a multi sort of a uh, sensor system and a multi uh, weapon system dealing with it and it is highly ai based because the data which it gathers is quite a lot and the processing needs are definitely uh, ai based uh, solution to it so it's a big uh, uh, it's going to be playing a big role in the coming world and the swarm technology where small you already seen drone shows in various functions and similarly these drones can work together and uh, go in for a specific task whichever is assigned to them in the war uh thank you so much sir our next question is for uh, lieutenant general shokin john sir uh hello sir looking at the flat uh, Euro- ukrainian pla- planes and the decimated uh, decimated civilian infrastructure infrastructure would it be fair to say that the insurgency operations beyond the russian lines be as different for the ukrainians forcing them to possibly rely on the lone wolf sab- sabotage rather than uh, traditional insurgencies like russian based in grozny grozny area uh shokin chan sir is there mm, uh, uh, any one of you answer uh the fact that a raid of this kind did take place uh means that yes uh, operations like this are possible in the russian territory too and it will have to be lone wolf operations because the russians uh you uh, there are uh, russian speaking uh people in ukraine but not the other way around to that extent and therefore uh it is people going from ukraine and trying uh, such a uh, activity or such operations in uh, russia may be little more difficult uh, than banking on the lone wolf operations secondly there is a fair segment of russian population which is against the war as well as against the uh, shall i say uh, putin's philosophy and therefore to find the lone wolf is also not a problem it's a case of money uh, you can buy some people and have it conducted and that's perhaps a easier option than sending your own person uh, who may may not uh, be well received the other side have i answered your question yes sir thank you so much uh our next question is uh, for okay it's a major general shashi astana sir only uh, yeah. sir what is your opinion on the recent friction between russian military forces and the wagner forces on the battlefield would this be just a small footnote of the conflict or will it implode uh a, would we have a bosnian like situation yes sir yeah okay. it's a small footnote to the conflict for the reason because what happens is uh, it's not only uh, when you have a gain in a war there are many claimants now bakhmut is a very important gain and wagner group has done very well they have surrounded it uh, they launched this operation <clears throat> they have been quite successful and it's a sizable gain and russian military and russian general, general some of them uh, have not been able to do that well in in, uh, in certain other areas so it's a shall i say unhealthy competition between the two side uh, between the two groupings within the same force or fighting on the same side uh, which in my opinion will get resolved and therefore subsequently uh, they all are fighting i don't think that bakhmut operation has got affected by this so far i don't think so uh, the wagner group raised a noise because they wanted more resources and after that uh, intervention was done by the political hierarchy and they were given more resources so it was resolved to some extent so i don't visualize that that is going to be a problem as far as bosnia like situation is concerned yes uh, there will be a problem uh, as i mentioned i think in my talk as well that uh, there is nothing like unemployed jihadi when a guy uh, gets used to earning out of weapon then he will do it in his country also when he goes back and therefore uh, that is going to create a problem in european capitals 
when these people go back. Uh, as of now, everybody who has been put there is being called as uh, a volunteer uh, or a mercenary. Uh, and there are private armies also which are employed. There are non-state actors, many kind of non-state actors which have been employed. But one point is very uh, important to note that all these people who have gone there uh, have been given enough money. That's number one. They've also been used. Uh, this, this channel has also been used to induct some of the professionals of the Western militaries because there are certain sophisticated equipment which Ukrainians cannot operate. And therefore, under the garb of volunteers, there are certain military personnel of United States as well as of UK and as well as of other countries who are the, who are uh, operating these systems and they are being caught and they are generally being released in the prisoner's flap because both sides have used mercenaries. No side is a holy cow. And therefore, uh, an arrangement of prisoner swap gets arrived at because everybody wants his favorites to be released. And that's how uh, the whole system works. Uh, thank you so much, sir. All right, we have our next question for uh, Lieutenant General P.R. Shankar, sir. Uh, hello, sir. Can civil military fusion, if gone unchecked, perhaps in the worst case scenario, changing the nature of the polity to a security state? Uh, you with us, sir? Oh, I think sir is not there. Okay. Uh, R.S. Panva, sir, you want to answer question? The same question? Any one of you can take up the question. All right, uh, we can just proceed to the next question then. Uh, firstly, I, I might have okay. that question, but uh, I'm not yeah. clear as to what is, is uh, uh, Argish there, uh, there with us at the moment? Yes, sir. Argish is with us. Argish, can you just rephrase your question to uh, Trend General yeah. Arrest? You think if gone unchecked means uh, in what sense has it gone unchecked? I have not understood that. Uh, Argish, you can unmute. Okay. Uh, so it's it, it it sounded like an extreme case scenario but in cases i meant for example an extreme uh, an emergence of a, of a complete defense elite in itself for example we have seen in the case of pakistan it is just a uh, rare scenario which which can happen that 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 was my question in extreme rare circumstances if civil military fusion happens we can see a rise of defense industrial setup which will dictate all the policies of the state itself okay okay Okay, so Sorry, may sir. I take a minute? And, and, and you're framing this question with respect to uh, in our context, in the Indian context, that if you have too much of civil military fusion, will be there towards the security state. Is that what you're asking? No, sir. In general, in general, in so general. globally. Uh, I'll take uh, I'll take a minute, sir. Chair, can you can I answer it? <coughs> yes, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, so your question actually is uh, you know now it's clear uh, after General Panwar has asked, uh, you know, we can't go Pakistan way. Pakistan is a different uh, country altogether and civil military fusion has got nothing to do with, uh, you know, uh, it's going the uh, dominant by the army or defense forces or the military. Basically, civil military fusion is that, uh, like, uh, I covered China's model, uh, to my mind, is a very good model and it is under various six verticals, as I said. and. Uh, what it means basically is that whatever can be used in civil can also be used for military and vice versa. That's what it means. If you develop a skill, the same person can be used in military, same person can be built, uh, used in civil as and when need arises. If you have infrastructure, same thing. If you have technology, same thing. And technology working in parallel, not in civil use first and then coming into military too late already. So that is what it means. So fear of, uh, uh, you know, military dominating the country because of civil military fusion is i think misplaced uh, it won't happen it, it's not uh, nothing to do with the fusion as such yeah so, sir can i add something with my yes what actually he meant that time was civil and military fusion in the sense of technology in the sense of talents in the sense of skills which we have been trying to get by in our own context through various uh, strategic partnership policies to participation of private sector for the defense weapons and uh, particularly they become important when you go to what General Pawar was, was talking about 
artificial intelligence and uh, all these areas where you need this technologies which a particular person can only develop within himself so we have been attempting for it it is not that military is going to dominate the political spectrum of the country that's what happened in pakistan it is not that context which is there the context is that we must share our uh, you know what we call ecosystem industrial ecosystem and we also must share our technological ecosystem and there should be a good handshake and the handshake or interface must be well defined through a protocol i understand what you may come from there's another model where people keep saying and it's been told for a very long time for us that the military industrial complex will define the national policies and uh, us has gone for conflict it has done in last uh, 22 years it has gone into 22 countries and created conflicts hundred eight conflicts has created and everybody feels and uh, understands that probably is for the gain of the military industrial complex so that's a different uh, kind of trajectory but what he was meaning that as far as these two handshakes are concerned at skill level at technology level and uh, are sharing our defense or in uh, industrial uh, ecosystem we must get closer so that we can use the total national power for the sake of projecting our national power towards the adversary thank you uh, thank you so much sir uh, due to the insufficient of time we will take last two questions uh, one is for uh, dr shishastana sir uh, hello sir yeah. how the war yeah. continued like the vietnam will have the economic effect in long run on the indian market as we have already witnessed the price rise in certain things that we import from the war torn countries right now russia and ukraine uh, if the war continues certainly the whole world will be affected and so will india uh, luckily we had some uh, good policies in place so in the comparative chart we were slightly better off than others but it is not that they, it has not affected us adversely it has affected us adversely and it will continue to do so uh, in case uh, it it continues similarly we have a direct problem in a manner that Rus there are there are a fair amount of defense equipment committed by russia to be given to us in a given time frame uh, that time frame can go out of gear so these are the two major implications which may have uh, which we will have Uh, similarly there was also another question on my name uh, regarding uh, chair if i can if i can answer that uh, it was written there that uh, is the corruption charges are they okay are they correct or not apparently they are correct for the simple reason because usa has appointed a committee to look into those charges and uh, uh, many people have been sacked including very close allies of zelensky which includes the defense minister and deputy defense minister it couldn't have happened just like that there is another theory which is going around that in a shipping ship a sinking ship uh, people are actually leaving uh, because they all are very clear that zelensky will be airlifted and we may perhaps have a problem that is a story which has not been corroborated by anybody but yes corruption uh, scandal uh, zelensky himself has said so i am sure he wouldn't have said it otherwise uh, thank you so much sir uh, we have uh, last two questions for uh, rs panwar sir Okay, so the first question is, hello, sir. You had mentioned that there must be a state-led effort in the cyber operation uh, lead to the trial racing back to the government itself. Wouldn't it create a diplomatic issue? Should have something similar private ecosystems like the troll farms of Russia to have a deniability? Yeah, and I've seen the second question also. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Also, uh, I'll read it myself once I answer this one. So okay. it's a it's a good question. uh what basically you are saying that cyber operations you are relating it to the gray zone i mean when you don't go in for an all out conflict when cyber operations are not in support of military operations because that's a valid support when you do cyber operations in support of military operations um if we assume that the military operation itself was justified in the first place then the cyber operations in support of military operations are also justified and that is where i'm not even saying that the state should be in the lead i'm saying the armed forces should be in the lead for offensive cyber operations which are conducted and that's how we go in for a multi domain operations we have a five uh, we talk of a five dimensional battle space today we have the traditional domains of land sea and air then we have space and cyber space so if it has to be conducted in synchronism 
all these facets they should be capabilities within the armed forces when it is part of a justified military operation now coming to the scenario which you have in mind when facing this troll farms and even other cyber operations which may be conducted during the gray zone so i agree with you for such operations there has to be plausible deniability and for such operations you would need to take uh make use of non state actors for plausible deniability but even in that scenario because you know it's an offensive operation which you are conducting in another country it could be cyber operation against a critical infrastructure to send out a signal so for example if china has attacked our electrical grids i mean we we are attributed to china it is for what for sending a signal that they have cyber capability so be aware that's the type of signal that they are sending so our armed forces also might like to do that on the other hand there could be cognitive operation now that's a different ball game altogether where you are targeting societies and when you target societies somebody mentioned in the second question internal disturbances is there a second question internal disturbances etc i think that's the second question so i'll try and answer together both of them there you are targeting societies when you ta start targeting societies there's no laws of war which have been laid down for societies targeting societies or armed forces or some you know offensive forces targeting societies so there's no international law to guide that that's a new phenomenon which has been taken place or evolved in the last couple of decades because of the emergence of internet and social media platforms etc etc and these internal disturbances that you're talking about george soros was on the news and so many others farmers request farmers protest etc etc where external forces are trying to destabilize us and so there are ethical questions which come into the picture i'm veering a little bit but the ethical questions which come into the picture if china and pakistan are exploiting the societal and ethnic and let us say religious fault lines within our country to destabilize us who should be responding to this after all strategic effects are being created should as a nation we should we do this against population populace of uh, adversary countries that's the first ethical question or should we just fight it with they say should misinformation or disinformation be fought with disinformation or should it be fought with uh, information with the correct information what's the right strategy because the ethical questions associated so it's a different ball game which uh, nations have to evolve their strategies and policies and whatever the way it evolves so now i'm talking of cognitive operations so to summarize i'll put it very crisply for cyber operations which are to be conducted in conjunction and support as part of uh, operations in another country as part of multi domain operations the capability must definitely rest within the armed forces that's my view and for gray zone operations where you require plausible deniability you might need to take the services of non state actors with or without uh, maybe again under the control of the armed forces that's a strategic decision to be taken but there uh, you cannot have direct involvement of the armed forces that's for the cyber operations part for the cognitive operations part well we are being targeted we have to take a strategic decision what do we want to do about it should we build capability we should definitely build capability but who should have this capability well that's a big question which we have to think of as a nation thank you okay i think uh, we can wrap up the session now uh, yes sir i think yes sir we can do it <laughs> okay uh, thank you very much what remains to be done is to clap for the speakers for their very great uh, insight into the thing so all of you thank you very much and thanks a lot it was a wonderful session god bless <laughs>